Um, okay, yeah, so I'm from Counterfactual. My name is Liam. I am a core developer on Counterfactual. Um, I don't have slides, so I'm just going to give a very brief overview of what we are, what are we working on, how does it work, and what's the benefit, and this kind of thing. So, uh, the basic idea of Counterfactual is that we're trying to build an open and generalized framework for the use of state channels in any kind of decentralized application. So, there's a lot of stuff that needs to be packed in to make that work. Um, and we're essentially using a lot of uh, research that Jeff and, and some of his team have been doing uh, over the past several years and turning that into like real workable code that anyone can kind of import. So um, I'll go from kind of the ground up, what is a state channel? Um, we, are ch we basically are trying to go from like the most fu uh, fundamental parts of a state channel and up. And so what we consider to be a state channel is essentially it is any time in an application that you have a finite group of people, like n number of people, that are doing regular uh, transactions amongst each other in which the, um, they're updating some value or some state or some, something that only matters to those finite group of people. So this is common in games such as Funfair where the casino operator and the person playing the game, they want to know what is the state of the game because they both care about that state because that's what's going to determine how their own money gets distributed. So it's essentially a unanimous consensus uh, kind of technique where the people that care about the money or the funds or the state that's locked up are exactly the people that are validating each, transac or validating each uh, state update. Um, and they each need to sign off on every single state update, so it's, like I mentioned, unanimous consent. So that's what a state channel is, and it's a very broad definition. It's, it's, it can encompass a lot of things. So what we've tried to do is figure out how can you implement that into, right now, Ethereum, but in, in future, any kind of blockchain application, so that any developer can kind of build on top of it any time they have one of these situations in their dApp. So we call this framework or this technique counterfactual. The general idea behind it is that we don't think that you should have to write any kind of application logic whatsoever on chain, um, or at least in the very, at, the, at the very minimum amount in the contract that all parties put on chain for the state channel, and you can put all of that off chain. So um, I'll kind of walk you through the process of opening a state channel and then what you can do with it once it's open. So the minimum requirement that we kind of have is that any um, group of people that want to do something amongst each other open a multi-signature wallet on the chain. So say it's two people, they open a two of two, um, so you have to multi-signature wallet on the chain. That's all it does is the basic multi-signature functionality. It allows you to execute some transaction um, by passing in the, the bytecode essentially of that transaction and signatures from all parties saying that we want to do this thing. So that's the minimum requirement you put on chain to begin with. Then what you do after that is you do something that we call counterfactually instantiating a new contract that doesn't exist yet, but you give it the properties that were it to exist on chain would do the outcome that it's describing in the code. So I'll give an example of a nonce counterfactual contract. Um, essentially what you do is you take uh, a contract that has some state in it, let's say it's a nonce, so it's literally just an integer n. Um, you write the code for that contract, so it's in solidity, it's a basic contract. And what you do um, is you basically take the bytecode of that, of that contract, uh, sign that bytecode from all parties involved uh, in this A channel. You then catch Act 256, generate some random integer or some random hash of that uh, contract, and you take that, and what you all agree upon is like this contract, that this new hash that we have, will map to an on-chain address. So what you've generated is a specially unique uh, address or a unique hash that maps to an address where it's to be deployed on chain. So how do you do that? Well, we have another contract on chain that's a single globally deployed contract called a registry that it's the same thing for every single state channel use case. It just defines the same logic I just described. It has a function called deploy. You pass in the byte code of this thing and signatures from all parties involved. It does the operation in that um, function, like catch check of the code and signatures, and it adds to a single table. The keys are those hashes, the catch check of the code and the owners, and the values are the deployed address. So this function actually will, will deploy the contract for you. That's it, very basic table, address to, uh, count the hash to deployed address lookup. That's it, so what you now have is this technique which you can use to look up one of these hashes that are deterministic without doing anything on chain to an on chain deployed address. So that's what it means to kind of counterfactually instantiate something, to generate that address. So what we do is we take a contract like this nonce I mentioned earlier, they take the bytecode, sign it, do the catch act, you have this blob. That is the thing that you can now use to reference this contract were it to ever be deployed on chain. So you can do all kinds of stuff with that now. 
So let's say, for example, this is just a nonce. Um, you can agree between some state channel states between me and Shun Ti um, that the value is one. So we basically say, okay, we're going to sign some bytecode with the constructor arguments of this, this, this contract being n is equal to one. And we generate this hash. That is equivalent, essentially, to us having agreed upon that value. Now, this is only useful, of course, if you can use that for something tangible or put some state, lock up some state to use it with. And so you then want to figure out, okay, how can I deposit money into a state channel to use this for something? So I'll give an example of a payment channel. A payment channel is exactly the same situation. You take some code that stores balance of A and balance of B. Um, and essentially what you do is you just hash the code of that contract. Let's say, the, let's say that the constructor arguments um, are you know, five and five between one and T. Um, what we do is we, just, we have a few, other, like, a few other elements involved in that to make it so it's secure. What you can do essentially is then send money into the multi signature wallet, which is referenced in the bytecode of that contract, and then use that as the reference point to figure out who has which money. So from the external perspective on the blockchain, you have five going in, five going in from two parties. This, this stuff balances 10. That's all you see from the external perspective. But in the internal perspective, we've basically agreed to a contract that were to be deployed would take that 10 and distribute it five to me, five to Shinti. And again, in this contract, that's just a simple example that you could do anything else. So if for, for example, they will write you know, logic for one of their casino games. For a payment channel, you'd write logic for how you update it. So what's my balance now? It's maybe six, four, or seven, three, or something like this. And you can reference it with any other game. So you could say, take that toe game, where the winner gets three. And you could update the payment channel to be, you know, instead of seven, three, it would be like four, three. So I take out three and put three into take that toe game, and the winner gets that three. And these are all referenced by using the technique I mentioned earlier, taking the hash of this bytecode, <laughs> signing it, and using that as like a, as a pointer, the same way you'd reference any other smart contract in Ethereum, to that pointer. And then it all goes through this other registry contract, which will resolve it in that simple table. It's a very straightforward technique, but it allows for all kinds of possibilities. So that's, that's the basic method. Um, the goal of this method is essentially to be able to have all the exact same security properties that Ethereum has, but without having to do any on-chain transactions, which obviously is very beneficial, because then you don't have to pay fees, uh, and you don't have to do any confirmation times for any updates in one of these state channels, which obviously is like, super useful for any kind of application where you're doing trend-based games or something that requires instant finality in your DAP. So that's the general idea of a state channel. There's all kinds of extra things. One of them is, um, or all kinds of extra things that you need to build in order to ensure its security. So one example might be, let's say we're doing a, state, say we're doing a payment channel in here, um, and I want to say, send, I want to um, send money to Shanti, so we have at n equals zero, I give him seven, uh, or I, this, the balance is seven, three, and with n equals two, the balance might be five, five, and so it will have changed, but he obviously would prefer for seven, three, where he has seven, so he might submit that later, that earlier state when it ends equal one, and so what I need to do then is we be able to react to that um, kind of almost that, that incorrect deployment on chain. So what I can do is take the other signed copy that we had and n equals two, put that on chain, and basically through a timeout mechanism ensure that my copy will win. So this allows you to essentially um, keep doing updates and signing these updates, but as you increase each one, you're guaranteeing that the latest signed copy is the one that is um, essentially the, the one that kind of ends up being the way the funds are distributed. But again, they don't necessarily need to be distributed at each time through a dispute. In the cooperative scenario, we both agree to essentially sign a transaction saying that from the multisig, we'll send out three or send out whatever it might be. Um, so we don't have to spend any, any um, we don't have to do any deployments on chain for a cooperative exit. Um, the same thing with, um, basically, the same thing with a deposit as well. We sign a few contracts saying that if the balance is more than some amount, um, then anything more than that amount, which would be, say, the current balance, um, I will get it. We sign these off-chain first and then beforehand, so in the case something um, goes wrong, we can get the money out, and then I just safely put in that amount of money uh, and above what the existing balance is. So you can do an instant deposit as well. So that, that's kind of the general idea. So other um, supporting services are, what if, uh, what if like Shunti and I are in a state channel and he closes his laptop and I start sending him updates and he's just not responding to me whatsoever? Um, or, or, or in another situation, I submit a false update where I had way more money, but there's a future update that we both signed where he has more, and his laptop's closed or he's off somewhere. How does he uh, basically ensure that he gets the funds before the timeout closes? What he can do 
is he can essentially uh, pay somebody else, like a third party insurance provider essentially, small amounts of money which can also be channelized to ensure that in this scenario that person will always be monitoring for the set of these hashes, these counterfactual addresses. Um, if they ever are deployed into the contract, they will watch for all of them and if I ever do that on Shindy's behalf, they will deploy the contract for him. So he can essentially contact an insurance provider to guarantee total uptime. So it doesn't matter if he closes his laptop or he's gone as long as he has this insurance service. Uh, another service is um, anti-griefing. So let's say, for example, um, we play a game tic-tac-toe, I win the game, I say, hey, Shinti, I won the game, here's the new balance where I have more than you, and he just doesn't respond to me whatsoever. He can just grief me and not respond and force me to deploy all my contracts to chain, which obviously costs transaction fees and expensive for me. He can just like straight up just grief me just because he wants to see me suffer, essentially. Well, there's actually services you can build for that, which are essentially technique, well, the obvious solution is you can basically pay, both of us can agree to pay a witness to on both of our um, behalfs, essentially take all assigned transactions between each of us and be able to make claims as to who is the one not responding, and in those situations, penalize that person. But there's also a way you can do this um, in kind of a decentralized way, and so we're working on that as well, where basically you can have a smart contract with a list of people that anyone can kind of join if they put up a certain amount of stake that will basically act as witnesses for any given state channel. So in the situation where, say, somebody doesn't respond, uh, there'll be a list of people who are incentivized and uh, incentivized to basically take all transactions that we do between our state channel and like, kind of witness them and see who is the one not responding in this, in the, or who, who has sent the transaction at a certain point in time. In this way, in the scenario where Cynthia wants to just make me, make me suffer, uh, he can be penalized provably um, and safely as well. So these are all this, another kind of a supporting service. Uh, the cool thing about state channels as well is that you can kind of route them together. So if, three, if uh, there's a state channel with two people, A and B, and there's another one with B and C, you can move money between A through C without having to require B's in involvement at any step, except for the very beginning where you say, this is how much we want to route through you. So essentially what people can do is kind of put up a certain amount of collateral to be in a network, and this is exactly the same way that Lightning works, for example. Um, the, the good thing about this situation, though, is that once the money has been agreed upon, say between um, th you know, A, B, and C, once uh, A, B, and C agree that B will put up, say, like 10 Ether, um, that A and C can route between them, once it, they all sign off on that amount, you can safely, through again using this counterfactual instantiation method, set, set it up such that uh, B does not need to be involved what, at any point between A and C's dealings. So A and C can do a tic tac toe game and they can do whatever they want, all using B's funds without B even knowing what's going on. Um, so this is another useful property of the generalized component of our technique. Anyway, so this, this is generally how state channels work. Uh, what are we doing? We are, well, we've kind of come up with this technique. That's the first thing we're doing. The second thing we're doing is we're building a framework. So we're calling this kind of actual.js, which we're going to be releasing quite soon. It's essentially a set of all these contracts as well as a library that you can essentially put into the browser that makes it dead simple for any develop, uh, decentralized application developer to import um, with a very basic interface uh, akin to something like, you know, give the, certain give, the number, give the parties involved in this A channel and the general operations you want them to be able to do, and it'll deal with all of this. It'll build the supporting services for you. It will set up the contracts in such a way that you know, it's safe for you to be able to deposit money into it, and essentially it makes it dead simple for a decentralized, uh, decentralized application developer to build their debt. So we're focusing on that right now, and that's kind of our core project that right now we're, we're building up that eventually we're gonna give out to the community to start building on top of. So that's kind of the counterfactual project in a nutshell, is this core research on this technique as well as the, uh, the library that we're building to make it actually viable for real dApps. Like, in, in an, an ideal, ideal scenario is that in the future, for example, ap applications like uh, Funfair, for example, will be able to get on the ground and running with this technique from day one versus having to build this tech stuff from scratch, which they've already done like, an enormous amount of work on, which is extremely commendable, but in the future we think we can make great progress as an industry if this stuff is standardized. So that's the kind of the goal of the project. Um, personally, I, I think the state channels are one of the most important immediately actionable scaling solutions because none of this is blocked by any, um, any kind of research or hard force need to happen or anything like this. This is all immediately applicable right now today. It's just engineering work that needs to be done that's somewhat complicated. Um, but we're the ones trying to figure out how to get that stuff shipped in production for everyone else to use. So 
Um, once it's out there, you'll be able to have any kind of decentralized application, have instant finality, which I think is an important property for a good experience that any user can have. Um, so that's why we're building it. Um, so yeah, I think that's the kind of majority. So if there's any questions, I'm happy to take any. Um, yeah, so does this get by the gas limit? Um, basically, everything that you're signing is something that you are expecting that in the, in the worst case, in the case of a dispute, will be able to be run on chain. Um, and so you wouldn't want to sign something that just should, would not be able to run on chain. So it does, it does adhere to the same kind of limits, but um, you don't need to, so what's that? Yeah, there, there's, there's one subtlety to that, is that instead of having to run it all in like a single contract, you could break it into several different pieces on chain. Um, so it's just, it allows you to essentially write an application, it, 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 the same general properties as a regular on chain application, but if you're doing it in a state channel, you can do it in such a way that uh, does not require you to put it all into a single contract, uh, which might be more convoluted. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the exact same stuff that you would do on chain, but since the group of people involved in the state channel can just agree on what the output is, with each of them independently verifying it on their own, um, you don't need to run it on chain because everyone agrees. And then what if you need to run it on chain and then like the last, the last gap is dangerous and you're no longer able to like put that one to the side and not chain? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> yeah, that gives you a chance to answer that one. Uh, you shouldn't be anywhere near the block gas limit on an individual chunk. If you think it's anywhere near, like just, just for capacity problems, like don't assume you're going to be able to buy the whole block anyways. Um, assume that you're competing against other people. Prices might go up. You might be in the middle of a status ICO. Who knows? Um, so you need to already break it down into chunks. If you have a truly massive amount of computation, you need to be planning that when you go to chain, you'll be using something like Truebit. Um, and that's fine. You can also do that. So in the channel knowing that you will go to Truebit and that the output of Truebit will give the correct answer, you can plan ahead for all of that and all the parties in the channel will still assume the outcome is the same. So this is all, it's all worst case scenario. You need to have this in the worst case so that you never need it. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's our that's our core focus internally right now is building out a library that does this stuff in a way that's usable for DApp developers. Yeah. Yeah. So right now we're just building it for like for the case this for the <laughs> such that we can get this thing working ASAP. We're setting it up in a way that we expect the people to be running a server that you know, basically there'll be a kind of a, a client-server-like relationship where one of the parties is the one running a kind of an operator that allows for the transmission. Um, we have built demos with web WebSockets. The, the actual layer between the individual parties is not a thing that uh, needs to be in any particular way. We're trying multiple techniques, but ideally in the long term, this will be a pure peer-to-peer -peer thing like with lib P2P or Whisper. But um, for the short term, just to get this thing working, like uh, probably we're assuming that you have a server. Yeah, it's just like RESTful API right now. But again, we have a version with WebSockets and that, and it just, it's, it's whatever we are kind of playing with at the time. We think ultimately for the library, um, we're likely also going to be providing a uh, kind of a hub kind of model as well, so that'll communicate to that um, for the majority of these things, and so that'll probably with, be with a server. But um, again, like in an ideal world, these things are, these things are more decentralized, but we just want to get this thing working right now, which will probably be the RESTful API. Uh, yeah, I don't really see like, sorry, w why should you use state channels versus side chains? I don't really see any, th these aren't like comp competitive solutions, like really, like, it depends on your use case. The fundamental limit of state channels is that you can't do what we're calling measures over public participation, which essentially are situations where you as the group in the state channel want to be able to prove some fact to the outside world. Like maybe if you're doing like some voting thing in which you 
it's really important that you have to have like some set of voters that are the, the set of voters for this thing. You want to prove the outside world that you came to a conclusion. All of them can agree and say this is what it is, but it's not necessarily a proof computationally that something happened. Uh, there's a lot of cases where this is important. The case for, um, look, maybe I'll take another example is like with CryptoKitties. A lot of cases with CryptoKitties, you want to be able to signal out to the world what's going on with like the, like who got which CryptoKitty and who bred with whom and other people will want to interact with things that are not necessarily situations that they're already involved in. Say channels are useful when you know exactly who's involved. It's a finite group of people and you want to just do things amongst those people really quickly. It's, it's essentially just, it's a group unanimous consent protocol. It allows for instant finality, zero fees, no confirmation times, because everyone agrees. It's, 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 a, it's just when you have a, that situation, which honestly is the majority of situations, um, or to a large extent of situations, um, that, uh, that's, that's when you want to use state channels. But not everything is like that. Sometimes you need to do something that signals to the outside world what's going on, and that's when you probably want to use a side chain. Uh, or one of the other things that, or pla yeah, pl I, yeah, I'm very pro plasma, so plasma might be a good thing you might want to do. Yeah. Any questions? Uh, it's say instant finality without the caveat that it without the with the caveat that it won't get re say, say it again. Yeah, when we say instant finality, it means you have in your possession a thing that guarantees were you to put this thing on chain, you would get the thing, the the state that you want. Still true, right? Say it again. Trade between me and you. So basically, the, think about it this way. Let's say you and I are in a state channel, like I have five, you have five, and you send me two okay. um, in the state channel. From the outside world, no one knows what's going on, it's just 10. It just looks like there's a multi-stick with 10 in it. Yeah. But between you and I, I know that I have seven and you have three because we've signed off on that transaction. The reason why we consider this to be instant finality is because at any given point in time, I can finalize exactly on chain by running this, basically run, deploying the contracts that we agreed upon that says I have seven and you have three. And that will essentially take out from the multi-sig the seven, give it to me, and give you the three. That's what it do, right? Yeah, it's well. Like, it, this this technique can be generalized. Any blockchain can run a multi-sig. Right? Uh, yeah, I'll let Jeff j jump in. So. Yeah. So the whole the whole point of secure state channel design is the ch channel has been designed so that that can't happen. If that can happen, you don't have a secure state channel design. So um, finality in, in crypto economic systems is not about having actually done something, it's about being certain of something. And as soon as you receive it, if the state channel is set up correctly, you are certain of it. And it is easy to set the parameters so that you can be certain. Now, if you're getting really aggressive on performance and you try to tighten the parameters right up to the limits, um, you can make a bad state channel where you won't be certain. But the type of certainty we're talking about is like, um, like in the, in the worst case scenario, you could write a state channel that would say, sometime in the next six months, mention this to the chain. I mean, what are the odds that somebody can stop you from mentioning something to the chain for six months? It's very low. So in that case, you are basically 100% certain the instant you receive it. So state channels make liveness assumptions of the underlying chain. Um, anything that you put into the channel you have to wait until you consider it confirmed. So, yes, it's instant finality relative to the chain. If the entire underlying chain burns and dies, the state channel doesn't save you. Yeah, yeah, you're making assumptions just like plasma. Um, uh, the the fundamental safety of plasma um, assumes that. Um, well, Plasma is slightly different because you can have a separate economic consensus. But if you have a dictator chain on Plasma, then um, your safety goes away if the, fun if the base chain burns and dies. Yeah. Or if you have Ethereum, it goes away if Ethereum burns and dies. So, uh, like the full analysis here is um, 
there's, there's what you can do, and then there's what the Nash equilibrium is for what you do do. Yeah. So um, what you can do is just take everything to chain, and uh, if, if the person is being the perfect attacker, you won't be able to tell who did something wrong, but it'll cost them as much as it costs you, and they don't gain anything. Um, so if that's the case, then the Nash equilibrium is for them to never do it in the first place, because all they're doing is costing themselves money, and they're not getting any advantage. The only way that somebody would do this on purpose is if they literally want to spend their own money just to hurt you. There are surprising ways you can do this in the real world as well, uh, by the way, if you want to hire a hitman to hurt someone or something. Um, so if you're willing to spend your own money to hurt someone else, sometimes you can do that within a very small bound in a state channel. Um, that's not in and of itself automatically a problem, but if it is, there are other techniques. Um, Doing nothing doesn't prevent the bet from resolving. The only thing that you can do in a state channel is force the thing to continue on chain. Not you can't stop it. Right, but if if the difference is between losing thousands in the channel versus losing thousands on chain and paying a fee, then it's still cheaper to lose thousands in the channel. That's why it's the Nash equilibrium. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Okay. Okay, cool. Thanks so much, guys.